understand? Fire. Just shut up, listen, and learn. There's a storm hitting us in six hours. We're gonna find out who's who. I want to make it 80 and wipe that grin off your face. Looks uncomfortable. It gets kind of itchy. Never know what you like till you try it. The one constant through all the years, Ray, has been baseball. And by God, I have had this Congress. Say it. Good night tonight? Oh, no. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Mark. And I'm Tom. And we are the, the Cinemaniacs. Cinemaniacs. So maybe a Beetlejuice sequel? I keep really? hearing I keep hearing these things. It's like one writer oh, yeah. and Michael Keaton yeah. are in, and I then they're not have, in, and then they're in, and they're not in. And I kind of have sort of heard it. Well, strangely, what was it? Oh, I watched The Fly uh, recently. And Gina Davis was a big star. I don't remember. And then she kind of just kind of disappeared, but I'd forgotten that she was in that. Oh, yeah. So, of course, she's dead, then. Of course, so is he, I guess, too. I guess the, the three leads are dead. Just giving everything away. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I was never a major Beetlejuice fan. I don't really oh, care. I think right. this desperate pandering to the 80s is rather pathetic, <laughs> so maybe they'll do it, maybe they won't. But anyway, and, and there's the thing. I guess aging isn't a big deal if you do Michael Keaton again because he's in such weird makeup right. to begin with, it wouldn't make a difference. Because otherwise, it's like, term, it's like Schwarzenegger in new Terminator movies. It's right. like, why did he get old? But I guess there's a way to figure that out. Uh, anyway, we saw some movies this weekend. Yes, we did. Uh, and uh, shall we discuss that? Shall we let them in on our private discussion of yeah. these films? I guess, you know, why we're here maybe? I'm, I'm here anyway. Okay. Honestly, I am actually here. As long as we're here. Uh, so, uh, first up, I think I'll take this one. Okay. I, 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 Go we, for it. We had set something else up and I am tearing it asunder. So, uh, what you're going to do when you're a lovely lady all by yourself, and this, I can relate to this deeply, when you're a lovely surfing lady all by yourself in a deserted beach and you decide to go out and ride the waves, but instead ride the sharp, pointy teeth of a big, bad shark. Well, you better hope, madam, that you land yourself in the shallows. <laughs> So Oops. yeah, um, so what you have here is sort of a cross between Castaway and Soul Surfer, with a, <laughs> with, right? with okay. a pinch of Jaws, mm -hmm. okay. and, uh, and, and, and just the essence of Sharknado in there. Uh, <laughs> Blake Lively is a woman who's going to surf a secret beach in Mexico as an ode to her dead mother, and uh, winds up getting chomped by a shark and is alone and has to survive until somehow help will come, which is hard to do when you're on a secret beach that nobody knows <laughs> right, about. Exactly. So it's one of those terminally hosed uh, film festival films that I like, or we call it at home the F That Film Festival, <laughs> or Never Gonna Do It Film Festival. Uh, surfing in a deserted beach that has sharks in it in Mexico, never gonna do that. <laughs> uh, so I quite liked this, actually. I know those didn't quite like it, but I, um, I was with it as a survival tale, okay. and it's gorgeously shot. And she's really good. She she holds the whole movie because there's like four people you see in <laughs> yes. this movie, and uh, it's it, one one thing I liked. This film almost won me over before I saw it. When I looked it up and saw that it was 86 minutes long, <laughs> I'm like, great! Right. They're not beating a dead shark with this, or a dead surfer, as it were. Um, I was a little nervous at the beginning because you see sort of a flash forward, which is something I hate and is is lame. I always feel like that is something filmmakers do when they don't have enough faith that a slow build in their film right, is going to work. exactly. So you see this little kid walk along this beach and pick up a sort of a half-broken uh, helmet, safety helmet that has a GoPro attached, and he reviews the footage, and you see somebody getting chomped by a shark, and they blah, 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 flash back to earlier. And when he started viewing the footage, and we saw it on the screen, I'm like, if this is found footage, <laughs> yeah. I'm going home now. <laughs> Luckily, it's not. And it, 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 again, it is really nicely shot for the most part in this one little area that it takes place in. But it's like the filmmakers 
were too afraid to have a movie look good. <laughs> so they keep doing these things like she's talking, she's FaceTiming on her phone with her father, and you have to see these little pop-ups of those things right. on screen so that you can get shaky, crappy video footage in there somewhere. And at certain points when people use the GoPro, you see the GoPro footage, which is shaky, crappy video footage that they also insert these little digital breakup and static things into, which GoPros don't do, by the way. <laughs> uh, send your free GoPro to me at Care of This Station. Uh, so that annoyed me because I'm like, how about maybe we could just see a movie that looks nice for a change without having to do this other crap. Uh, and toward the end, it's in my head, it is a fairly realistic portrayal of how someone might attempt to survive in this situation. Right. Toward the end, she goes into sort of like Roy Scheider at the end of Jaws mode. Oh, was, yeah. And she goes into like MacGyver Rambo mode, and that was a little <laughs> odd. Like the final confrontation between her and the shark was like it was lifted out of an action movie or a sci-fi channel movie. Now, if I took myself out of the context of what I had been watching up to that point, I, and, and, and even in that context, I was like, yeah, this is cool. <laughs> but when I think back about the wrapper that that scene takes place in, right. it's like this doesn't match the tone of the rest of the movie. Suddenly it's like action heroine, whereas before she was somebody who could barely move because she was had a, a chunk of her leg taken out. That aside, <laughs> I thought it was a, a fairly efficient hour and a half survival thriller, and it provided male audience members w with something that is sorely lacking in American and world cinema these days, which is a scantily clad female to look at for <laughs> an hour and a half. Uh, there were shirtless dudes in the film too, so you know, right. we, we covered that, but it was, it was sort of the flip-flop of what you usually get. At any rate, uh, I thought it was good. I thought it wasn't necessarily a Jaws ripoff. I mean, it's person versus shark, but so many films have been a direct ripoff of Shark of Jaws, including probably 90% of sci-fi channel movies where mm. there's some event and there's some threat and somebody knows about this threat and tries to, work, tries to tell the people who are holding the event, but the people who event don't want to know about that because it's a big, important financial event and then people start getting killed. Uh, so anyway, I thought uh, The Shallows was good. How about you? I was looking forward to it. Uh, I'm a diver. Mm -hmm. And so not only do I, uh, you know, uh, can I... Uh, em empathize with people who like might get stuck out either way out at sea or close to you or whatever um, and and so that attracted to me uh, I also uh, agree completely that much of this film is just beautifully shot it's just a gorgeous location um, and ultimately I was disappointed in this film because I felt that the filmmakers everybody involved didn't know what film they wanted to make uh, is it going to be uh, it started out for the first half hour, and as beautiful as Blake Lively might be, I was almost offended at how voyeuristic it was. Just reasons to get shots down her shirt and shots from underneath uh, with her legs straddling the board. I thought it was conspicuously focused on her feet. I'm just going to say you that. You think much so? About I don't know. But yeah. so for the first half hour, I was like, this. And again, again, I'm happy to look at it, but I also try to rise above it as much as I can and, and analyze it and say this is just not you know what the film needs to be. She, um, so then it moved on to the kind of survivalist thing and she gets attacked and she's stuck on this rock 200 yards from shore but she can't make it because the shark is there. Um, and I don't know if this was writing or directing or performance, uh, I think it's got to be a combination of all three, but she's there for like two days and th I don't think this is to give anything away really. but. She there's a 10, 15 minutes where she seems like she's almost about to die. She's just completely exhausted and she's hungry. She tries to eat a crab, a little crab that she finds and she spits it out and she's just going to die. And then uh, all of a sudden she's just got all this energy and she's just jumping around. And, and so that was weird. I didn't understand that. There was a lot of this that I thought, and then you mentioned her turning into uh, Rambo. I wonder if that was reshoots. I, I would love to find out. I don't like, know, they but... made a very realistic, calm film, and audiences were like, "There's not enough excitement." So they went back and they put, you know, <laughs> Rambet in there because right. it was weird. Um, I was, you know, they had some th this, and I have. I know the point of this. The point of this is a survivalist story, and you can't have Roy Scheider get killed uh, at the end of Jaws and all that. So your your heroine here has to survive. But good lord, that shark was four times her size. And it's attacking this buoy. For, first of all, I didn't understand. And I sort of respected this. This is why I'm, a, I'm of two, two sides to this. Uh, you know, uh, and I think the viewers, if they watch this regularly enough, know that I expect more from a film if I'm going to the theater. Uh, I think I'm going to enjoy this a lot at, on home video. I'm going to expect it to be uh, less 
logical maybe. Um, I liked the fact that she wasn't, uh, they gave us enough information about what she was planning to do and why that I could figure it out. But uh, she was constantly thinking of going out on that buoy and I didn't understand why there's this big metal buoy that she goes out uh, and then she, it would, she makes it, would, it and... It would, it would always stay above the water line. Right, but so I, I eventually got that. Uh, but you'd still think that's start Anyway, um, I think I was overanalyzing it. I think if you just chuck your brain at the door and expect uh, an interesting adventure flick, uh, I think it works really well. It's beautifully shot. I wish, I too wish they'd stayed, stayed that way. Texting has become so much a part of our society. I don't know how we're going to... Um, intelligently integrate that into motion pictures. But, it always seems cartoony. Yeah, there's the it. bit at the beginning she's texting and you see those little pop-up balloons and, and now I'm having to read it. Well, I don't go to a movie to read. If I want to read, I'll buy a book. Uh, do it visually. Um, but it has become such a part of our culture uh, that uh, I don't know how that's going to start integrating into it. I just hope it kind of wasn't the silly way that they did it in this one. So I was of two, uh, uh, two minds on this one. Uh, I did enjoy it. It was very quick. And while I'm sitting there watching it, I'm having a good time. Retroactively, I'm thinking, why did this happen? Why did that happen? Why did blah, blah, blah. So I'll, I'll give The Shallows a five, five or six maybe. This is one a lot of times younger relatives or people I know will ask me what's good in the theater. Right. And I'll usually go, nothing. Yeah, nothing. Um, <laughs> this is actually really, this, would, this is what I'd recommend to teenagers who want to see like a thriller movie. Because yeah. so much of what's out there that's aimed at them is garbage. Right. All oh, this, of which we have to watch. This is certainly higher caliber oh, than yeah. your basic action. And, and if you haven't seen a lot of other movies, it's sure. just it's an edge of your seat thriller that makes you sure. recoil in disgust at times. So now, I, I would recommend this way over the conjuring. I'll she has a little buddy that sticks with her. For, yes, a little Wilson. And I couldn't understand why in the world that thing was there until about two thirds of the way through the film, where they explain it. But it was so constantly there and weird that. And if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, maybe you'll figure it out. Um, uh, I just thought that was really distracting. For more than half the film, I'm thinking, why is this thing there? Uh, and it just really distracted me. They do explain it. Because what a giraffe it. is doing in Mexico. It, it was really, yeah, bizarre things. But Yeah, I, so maybe anyway. she's a Disney princess. <laughs> That's right. And it, it, just, it just couldn't fit on her shoulder because she was laying right. down the whole time. So, okay, anyway, moving on. Yes, please. Shall we? Uh, Matthew McConaughey is a, uh, supposedly in a true story, uh, is a Mississippi farmer during the Civil War, and he's helping out, but... Uh, starts to question which side is right, which side is wrong. Is anybody right uh, or is everybody wrong? And he decides that he's going to become a deserter and help out whomever he can in the creation of the free state of Jones. Don't know how long this film took to make, but Matthew McConaughey was there 99% of the time, I think, because, wow, talk about somebody who carries a picture. He's mm -hmm. in 95% of this thing, I would think. In, there are a few scenes, scenes without him. In yeah, there are very few. Um, didn't know a whole lot about this going in. I thought this was going to be a Civil War pick, and it uh, really, you know, it really isn't following him. Uh, he's out of the war pretty quickly, and most of it is about his surviving as a deserter and finding help uh, with, in particular, a group of uh, black uh, slaves who are apparently hiding out. They're not deserters from the war, I don't think. Um, they didn't really go into that. But it's about all of these, essentially, group of people who are either deserters or ex-slaves or uh, people escaping for whatever reason, and they hang out in the Mississippi bayous. And the armies can't get in there, and so they're able to to survive in there, and Matthew McConaughey is, is the lead. He develops a, a relationship with a black woman who had come to uh, his house earlier to help his wife and young son who were ill. Uh, the son was ill. So it's, it's all about how, uh, it's clearly a, a, a picture about interracial tensions and uh, black civil rights uh, and, and all of that. Um, lots of things we've seen before, so as this was starting, um, first of all, some really graphic, uh, and this isn't a negative, I think uh, this was done appropriately, um, war battle footage, that uh, as soon as this was starting, I was thinking, um, 
kind of like with the, with the Jaws thing. Do we need another shark movie? Do I need another war movie? I know war is hell. I know the Civil War was bad and brother fighting against brother. This showed me a lot of uh, several things. I won't say a lot. Three, four, five different moments of uh, the brutality of the war, of uh, um, what was going through maybe some of their minds, uh, certainly how long the war was. Um, and so this taught me a few things. I thought that was interesting. Um, it was a very slow picture, and I'm kind of rambling because... Um, like the film itself. It, it is rambling. It's not boring. No, it's but, good, I thought. Uh, but it is long. It was about 2.15, about that. I think, about 2 hours and 15 minutes. Um, so it is long. I thought it could have uh, wrapped up a little bit more quickly. It's supposedly based on a true story, and it, bopped, it has this strange... Uh, conceit of bopping back and forth between the Civil War and uh, was it early 1900s? Uh, uh, no, mid 50s or 60s. 50s, okay. Um, and how that kind of ties together. So uh, they're all about uh, racial tensions um, and society uh, versus itself, I kind of think. Um, it's clearly a vehicle for McConaughey, who is wonderful. There are some moments where um, I love watching actors' faces. And the really good ones, even though they're not saying anything, uh, you can see them taking in what other actors are saying and just watching subtle changes. And McConaughey is wonderful. I think he's one of our best actors alive today. Even just keep your eye on him if there's nothing else going on. And most of the time the camera's on him because he's in it so much. Um, ultimately, uh, I respect the film. Uh, it's very well made, some wonderful performances. Um, I think the three leads um, are really fine, including McConaughey. Um, uh, I, I thought it brought up some interesting points, uh, maybe not necessarily so much about the civil rights issue, because I don't think it taught me anything new about that, but uh, there's still enough there, and it's a well-made enough movie to, if you find it interesting, I think you're going to uh, have a good enough time with it for a couple hours. Maybe yeah. not a good enough time. That was just going to say. Any, okay. <laughs> I enjoyed it, but it wasn't right. a happy experience. Oh, yeah, how do you say that? Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, it takes you from McConaughey in the Civil War to becoming a deserter because he disagrees with wh who and why he's fighting, who he's fighting for and why. And, and he rounds up all these like-minded individuals, and they basically form the Free State of Jones, which is a county in Mississippi where they, they try to... Part is unfair taxation at the time. The, right. the South had this, or the Confederacy had this habit of basically just taking everything people had for the war effort and leaving them destitute. And it was usually the wives who were left behind where their husbands were fighting so they couldn't defend themselves. So he's sort of, it's sort of this little vigilante group who's, who's oh, yeah. fighting the man. And uh, it's interesting, and they, they grow in ranks until the point where they're having battles with Confederate soldiers. It's pretty wild. So it's, it's kind of this, like, you know, renegade... Uh, vigilante for the people kind of thing. Interestingly, while I was watching it, I felt like whatever political stance you may have in this world, you could see some of that justified in this movie. Like, you could say, oh yeah, see, that's why they shouldn't do that. That's why they should do that. I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, really nicely shot. Yeah. Some really nice locations in period setting. Um, I did feel like it, it was unfocused. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, I went in knowing nothing, which is how I like to see these films. And it's a Civil War. Oh, it's a Civil War movie. Oh, okay, well, now, now it's not a Civil War movie. It's about this. And then it keeps going. Like, it keeps feeling like maybe it's wrapping up, right. and then you see a, t a title on the screen, and you're sort of moving into some other area, or things start to happen. Like, at one point, uh, a friend of his, a freed slave or runaway slave, uh, it's a freed slave by that point, his son is taken by local guys, like, just kidnapped basically and they go to get him so you see McConaughey meeting up with this guy who's walking with a shotgun in his hand to his certain doom and they get in the wagon and they ride away and then a title card comes up that says blah 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 one year after emancipation yeah, eight and I'm like later and... so is this a year after that last scene and it's like no no this is moments after that last scene like some of that was confusing right and the bopping into the future with that court case I saw I could see why they were talking about that but you could have lost that entirely. Yeah. Because it, it, it was like, wh who is, why are these people? And it was only for like a few moments, and then you would go back to the McConaughey story. It is connected in a way, but I didn't think it was necessary here. Uh, I th again, I thought this was good. I thought it was very well made. It's interesting, fairly accurate portrayal of a piece of history from what I've read. It just, it, I think it could have used some tightening up, yeah. personally. But no qualms with it. It's certainly the best thing I've seen in the theater in a f several weeks, because right. most of what we see is garbage. Sorry. And an unusual thing to come out in the summer. When yeah. you're usually seeing it, the Avengers and everything like that. See it in a, a smart... theater with busted air conditioning, and it's like you're there. <laughs> there you go. Mississippi in the summertime. <laughs> uh, up next, we have a film that I didn't see, but what the hell, I'll introduce it anyway. So it has been, well, Don't I, look or, 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 or I'll introduce it. 
Uh, so it has been 20 something years since we last uh, joined the efforts of people in America and around the world fighting aliens who come to take over the planet and sap, sap our precious natural resources. No, it's not V, and I bet you wish it was because that was actually good. This is the <laughs> sequel to Independence Day entitled Independence Day Resurgence. <laughs> So, who is the star of uh, Independence Day, would you say? You I believe it was Randy Quaid or Will, Will Smith. I'd have to say it was Will Smith, in yes. my opinion. Um, he had all the best lines and everything, the one, uh, along with Goldblum there. Yes. Um, so, don't get your biggest star back, even though all he's doing is a, a cameo bit, basically, in Suicide Squad. Um, maybe he was, I think, ultimately, in, because... It was pretty clear going into this that Will Smith was not in. They get a lot of people back. Judd Hirsch is back. Um, uh, oh, I forget the name of the president. I feel awful. Uh, Jeff Goldblum is back. Um, are they on you? Uh, okay, well, just getting your reaction. Um, so you get some people back. Um, that's primarily because so much of this movie is trying to infuse cute little references to the first movie. Uh, basically, this is, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Because you didn't see this, so I'll, uh, I'll spend a little extra time talking, court. talking about it for me. Um, I had to drive outside of town because apparently uh, the distributors wanted too much from our friends at Keen Cinemas. They just want to put it to Keen Cinemas. I don't they, understand. They do, that. actually. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Walter and I did, did go out uh, to see this in Hooksit. And uh, this is basically Independence Day all over again. Um, didn't see it in 3D intentionally. I usually don't like the 3D, so I intentionally saw it in 2D. So there are four or five uh, entire sequences, you know, five, ten minute sequences where I'm sitting there just saying, well, this is o the only reason this exists is because it's in 3D and ships flying all over the place. The, uh, you had no other reason necessarily to do it because they'll attack the big ship and, oh, it didn't work, but we had a great chance to see lots of ships flying around and everything like that. So that was boring. Um, constantly thinking, you know, why, why don't you get Will Smith back for this? Why don't you pay him anything he wants? Because you basically have his character, because it's his son. Mm -hmm. And they have one throwaway line, they, the, his, the son comes in and he's going to go off and fly the big ship that's going to save, save us from all the aliens. And a reporter says, son, how do you feel about uh, taking off from a hangar deck named after your father who died as a test pilot during <laughs> one of the, you know, and, and it's just... This throwaway line to make reference to why Will Smith isn't there. I think ultimately, um, because going into this I was thinking, you got to pay Will Smith anything he wants uh, to be in this. I think he was probably the only one who was smart enough not to get involved sure. with this thing. Because it is so much uh, just a copy. Now, in retrospect, I'm thinking, it's been 20 years, um, only people uh, who are real movie fans or uh, unkind to their kids like I am and say, you gotta watch Independence Day. Uh, today's generation, I'll say, probably may not have seen Independence Day. It's not a bad the first thing, one. necessarily. It, well, I thought it was wonderful. Oh. I really liked the original Independence Day. I thought it well, fired on all cylinders. This one is just a straight copy. Uh, now, the effects are spectacular. They look, it looks visually uh, good. It, visually, it's gorgeous. The production design, and this is a strange one uh, to call out. I mean, there are films like, um, uh, the first Tim Burton Batman, maybe. Uh, Blade Runner, certainly, that you talk about. Look at the production design and how wonderful and futuristic it might have been. Uh, I loved looking at a lot of the subtle little things because the concept is uh, the aliens, you know, we beat them the first time 20 years ago. We've taken their uh, technology and it adapted it to our own. And so you see lots of great little examples of that. And that was loads of fun. So I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Uh, and the, and the uh, effects on that were a lot of fun. But other than that, um, for good and for bad, this is just clearly a copy, a duplicate of uh, Independence Day. And it's wide open for ID4 Part 3 if you want it. Um, I'm hoping not because if they can't do anything new, why do it? Sorry. I'm always grumpy these ID lately. ID 4 There's colon 3 and yeah. you release it pan and scan on DVD. But I'm bummed. Ah, there you go. Ah, that's inside something. humor. Uh, so, I didn't see it, and I'm not upset about that. Okay. Uh, so we thank our friends at Keen Cinemas yep. for what they did and didn't get, and we will uh, be telling you in two weeks So basically, now. I mean, it's actually worth saying good. 
Yeah, you know, I was yeah. pretty down on ID. Uh, Actually, for what Keen Cinemas did get, yeah. I think there were good movies this yeah. week. So there. Um, so yeah, go and see those if you could. If you if you choose to do so, Keen Cinemas is a fine choice as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Uh, up next, that which you may watch at home, home on video. video. Ooh, ooh. Home video. We're jumping into that kind of phrase. Home video. Phraseology that you well, created, as I recall last I week. Well, I well, mean, you, you, you it's been called named home, it. It's, I know well, that. We but. call it. The, let's call it home video. Okay. It shortens up the preamble. And let's call this one then. If you um, would. Uh, Sasha Baron Cohen and Mark Strong uh, are uh, siblings. Uh, one of them is a super high-tech uh, industrial super spy CIA agent who's set off on his new assignment. Um, and the only person who can possibly help him out is his uh, high school football hero brother, because they are the Brothers Grimsby. The tower speaks and tells you what to do. So... As is true for yes. uh, uh, Sasha Baron Cohen. Um, I, I went into this thinking this looked like a lot of fun. I like Mark Strong. He's, he's one of those guys that you recognize, but you can't ever really place him. Uh, Baron Cohen does so many different kinds of characters, you don't recognize him as Borat or as a lot mm -hmm. of the other characters that he's done. So I respect that from him, that he's, trying, he's always trying different things. This one, I went into expecting it to be... Uh, extremely crude uh, and brash and often stupid at times, which it exactly was. And it was also uh, at times laugh out loud, I can't catch my breath funny. So if, if you're familiar with his type of humor, with that Borat kind of thing, there was like, I can't believe, and Borat was a little bit different because mm -hmm. obviously they went out into the real world right. and shot this thing. This was all, uh, you know, just a regular Hollywood film. But that, uh, that they would stoop to some of the bathroom kind of level humor that you would expect from him. Uh, as long as you're familiar with that, I thought this was really uh, very funny. As an action flick, um, you know, a Mission Impossible kind of thing. The story works well enough. I didn't think the action bits, except for the very, very last moment where it really culminates. I didn't think uh, those held up as much as uh, they could have. I thought they could have spent a little bit more time with that. But, you know, overall, I respect that this guy tries different things. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought this worked pretty successfully as, um, and at times, extremely funny uh, action comedy thing. Well, I didn't see it. Okay. So I take your word for well, it. Well, I encourage you to see it at some point. I, you know, I like Perhaps. Sasha Baron Cohen's work overall. He does lean toward the aggressively crude to the yes. point of it just being like, really, come on. Right. But uh, I'm a fan. And of, this has that. Sir. I'm a fan of his early funny work. Okay. So uh, <laughs> I will probably will check this out at some point. Okay. Uh, if somebody hands it to me for free. Uh, so coming up next is a film sequel that you've all been waiting for. If you're a fan of the first movie, uh, Nia Vardalos and all of her extended family are back once again to shower the people with love and Greek pastries in My Big Fat Greek Wedding Two. Masher has a bear trap, spring-loaded catapult, and battering ram. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Two-word review, not subtle. Uh, this is <laughs> right. a very yeah. broad, this is very like regional theater level of projecting to the back row style <laughs> of comedy that's not really my bag. Uh, pretty inoffensive. I, I presume if you like the first one, you'd like this because I, it se I never saw the original. Okay. It seems like the entire ask. cast is back, yes. plus you know a younger generation they focus on a little bit, but not exclusively. So I think if you want to spend more time with these people, this does that. Uh, it's it's not my style of comedy. I think if somebody handed me a thin, shiny dime every time the word Greek was spoken aloud, <laughs> I'd be able to buy a car when I walked out of the theater. Uh, it's just so aggressively Greek. what it, it what it is, and right. nothing wrong. They are wonderful people, and uh, they 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 run some of my favorite restaurants that I eat at on the road. Uh, <laughs> but it's just this isn't for me. I think this is more. I think this skews more female. I think this skews yeah. probably more middle-aged and older female, and I think this skews definitely fans of the first film. I think you're exactly right with that, because um, uh, what I remember of the first one, and I, uh, yeah, obviously I've seen them both, uh, was that uh, I was, while it, it, is, it also is not my cup of tea or my kind of humor, um, uh, what I uh, remember of the first one, uh, I was really impressed with how unbelievably well I thought this blended with the first one. It was like, holy cow, it's, they shot, did they shoot this at the exact same time? Oh, wow. It looked the same, same actors, same pacing and story. So I do think that if you like my Big Fat Greek Wedding, uh, this is the, the advertising campaign was, this is bigger and fatter and Greeker. And that's certainly what they tried to make it was uh, much uh, Greeker. 
um, it, it plays uh, very much to that audience. So if you like her uh, and that kind of humor um, that, you've, that you got from the first one, this is just a, a really well done continuation of that. Not my uh, area of interest, but if you've seen it, you either think the trailer is interesting or you remember the first one, I think you're going to like this one a lot. You get what, you look, what yeah. it looks like you're going to get. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of getting things, uh, we got the next one and now I'm going to talk about it. Uh, so, uh, a group of people in Hong Kong pop a bus late in, late in the evening, uh, drive through a tunnel, and when they emerge on the other side of the tunnel, they're the only people left alive in the world. Uh, this film tells the tawdry tale of what happens the midnight after. Pet milk way. Oh, away out west where a man's a man. They mark their heifers with the pet milk brand. This movie is out now via WellGo USA on video. I believe okay. it came out last week. And it has some familiar faces. Simon Yam, who's been in a lot of Hong Kong movies for the last, since the 80s, basically. And again, it's a group of people of all walks of life who hop this bus and they ride through a tunnel and they come out and they're like, where is everybody? What's going on? None of our devices work. And they find a few dead people occasionally, and it's like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. So it becomes, what is this? So this is like a Twilight Zone episode almost. So it's like sci-fi, it's horror, it's drama. Okay. It gets into people trying, who are completely from different walks of life trying to work together and f briefly form like a new society. So it's kind of got the Walking Dead thing where it's like, okay, mm -hmm. this is the world now. We have to make, we have to A, figure out what happened, figure, make sure it doesn't happen to us, see if there's a way to undo this and also try to survive with people in a land where there's no law anymore. Huh. So uh, I thought it was really good, really nicely shot, kind of artistic. Um, it's subtitled, so if you don't like subtitled movies, you're missing a good movie in this case. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd recommend this to anybody who, uh, not even necessarily Asian film fans, but people who like a good mystery story, because ultimately it's never, I don't want to give it away, but it may, or, it may not be explained what went on, but in the end I didn't care because it's really about the journey. Again, it's okay. like Walking Dead. Walking Dead isn't really about zombies. It's about right. how people deal with this trauma in life. So uh, it, darkly funny sometimes, but also <laughs> deeply disturbing at times. Okay. So uh, The Midnight After, that's what it is. Cool. Uh, up next, we have another film if yes, you care uh, to. And you get to see lots and lots of stars and, and people that you've recognized and heard of uh, throughout uh, your Hollywood career. If you're like me, you might have been really troubled by these really creepy looking skeleton things that are walking all around and they would invade your nightmares. Well, there's one guy that you can thank about that and maybe you thank him, maybe you blame him, but uh, you have to know that it's Ray Harryhausen, special effects titan. The crime. So this is out now yep. via Arrow Video. We didn't announce formally the Arrow Video That's Corner. That's true. It's nice. I'll work on something like the that. Arrow, it's the Arrow Video Corner now. Uh, so this is a documentary from a year or so ago where uh, it's self-explanatory. It's Ray Harryhausen who was the, the master of stop motion right. animation. Absolutely. He did all this work by himself in his garage in London over you know a decade or two. Uh, it, I mean, when, now when just to interject, I mean oh, when when you look at the end of a movie and it's it's just special effects light and there's thousands Ten columns of for five people minutes. going on and it's Harry Housen. It's, yep. he, he was did one all guy. This. Yeah. And it, and it was, you know, if you don't know stop motion, it, it was it was a metal armature on on which he would build a model with foam rubber and it would be very realistic looking. Wow. And it's move one frame, yeah. move multiple items in the scene in yeah. one frame, click, readjust one frame, click with a back projection of whatever was in the movie at the time. So right. that's how you have skeletons fighting live action actors. What he, man was a genius what he did and he influenced everything that came after that. Yeah. And personally I would still rather see herky jerky stop motion than CGI because I know the stop motion things existed in <laughs> real life while the CGI doesn't look like it does. Right. So you get all the, the titans of special effects and, and sci-fi fantasy action movies are all on here saying how great he was and why. You get test footage from when he was trying out the skeleton for the first time. You see a lot of the actual props now and explanations as to how he did everything. It goes sort of year by year through his career because he, he, he made a right. set number of films and he stopped with Clash of the Titans in 81, I believe, uh, which I'm happy enough to have been alive when the last mm -hmm. Ray Harryhausen movie came out new. Uh, and I loved these as a kid. Yeah. So um, I've seen other documentaries about Ray Harryhausen. I don't know if this is necessarily the best one I've seen, but it's really good. Mm -hmm. And th that, that raw, raw, raw footage, rare footage, photos of the artifacts, the extras on this disc, there's trailers for all of his movies, there's Q&As from film screenings with, with Harryhausen and the filmmakers, there's extended interviews with everybody in the film. 
shots of them unboxing some of these artifacts mm -hmm. recently to take to this museum that's, that was display that was happening. So if you're a fan of Ray Harryhausen, this is a must see. If you are interested in the history of Hollywood special effects, this is a must see. Right. And it's really just fun and entertaining. It's breezy, it moves right along, uh, graphically very nicely laid out. I thought it was really fun. Yeah, I thought this was real well put together. I, of course, I'm a big fan of his uh, and love his work. Um, if I need to be critical about the film itself, um, as a, a work of art or as a, uh, as a motion picture. Um, I got a little tired of, and I know that it's the big names, you know, Spielberg up there, wow, we can say Spielberg right. was in it, Tim Burton was in it, all these different guys. I got a little tired of seeing them and I just wanted more of Harryhausen, more of yeah, his stuff, uh, behind the scenes things, just, just eat it up. And I think that's me as a fan, but I think anybody, um, uh, I hadn't, there's so much in, in this particular iteration of the doc about him that I hadn't seen, that they just kept enticing me. And uh, it's terrific. I haven't looked at the uh, extras yet. I did, um, you know, keep the entire, di you know, the entire disc, so I'm looking forward to seeing that again. But just the doc itself was uh, quick, as you say. Um, it's very entertaining, very informative, and I just thought, you know, this was, uh, I think, probably the highlight of my video viewing for this week. Whew. Just really loved it. Uh, speaking of Arrow Video, yes, we have one more. Okay, what better way? We it all it all leads up to this. The, 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 everything we've done for the duration of doing this television program leads up to talking <laughs> about this one film that I think has affected both of us very deeply in a meaningful way. Uh, what are you afraid of when uh, fruit attacks you and and is used in ways that it was against God and humanity? Well, you should be fearing, along with George Clooney, <laughs> the return of the Killer Tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess. So, uh, yes. there was a movie in the late 70s called Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. There was. It was uh, independently made, very crudely made, pretty silly and dumb. Um, I don't know how much of a theatrical release it ever had. I, have, I discovered it on video where right. it was a cult title. Huge and cult classic. Cult classic and more, more famous for the title than, and the idea right. than anything else. Uh, and then 10 years later or so uh, when home video hit and you saw a lot of these what I call sequels nobody asked for. There'd be these sequels <laughs> to movies that people, they had name value. And it was all based around the video store because the right. video store, everybody knew Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. They felt it was uh, financially... They could gain. They could gain financially by capitalizing sure. on that title and putting Do another video one out. express and all. And uh, so it's made by the guy who made the, the same guy made all these movies. So you have the same creative force behind all the <laughs> films. And I really like this movie. Okay. It is incredibly silly. I first saw it on USA Up All Night a million years ago. And there's a sequence where they make fun of product placement that I thought was right. really sharp and funny. And that's what always I always remembered about this movie. Uh, this is the first time seeing a really nice copy of it. I had it on video. The original oh, again, the new transfer video is tape. unbelievable. This is gorgeous. I watched it on a nice big monitor. It's colorful. It doesn't look old. The, 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 you can see the grain in a good way. Uh, George Clooney, pre, <laughs> yep. uh, pre-famed George Clooney is one of the co-stars of this movie, and he's pretty funny. John yep. Astin from Adam's Family and mm -hmm. other things is, is ridiculous. Um, it's, it's wacky. It's like a Zucker level of wackiness. There's a lot of self-referential stuff. That's being pretty Well, I mean, they, they break the fourth praise. wall a lot. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure that's what they were emulating. Uh, it's goofy. It's not overtly dirty. I mean, it's PG right. or PG-13. It, it's it's Randy occasionally, but yeah. even then, it's making fun of itself being Randy. Uh, I really had a good time with this movie. I mean, <laughs> I was surprised when I watched it again. I'm, I was just laughing a lot, and it made me really happy. So I quite enjoyed Return of the Killer Tomatoes. Uh, because it's Arrow, this thing is chock-a-block with extras. Right. You've got a commentary by the director, which is really cool because he gets into the history of this whole series of films and talks about how it was made and in business and financial stuff and how he got Clooney and how he did certain things. There's a 20-minute or so interview with the Clooney's co-star in the film. Okay. Uh, there's There are extras, uh, the trailers, TV spots, stuff like that. Extensive stills gallery. So if you're a Killer Tomatoes fan, uh, this is this release is going to be hard to beat. Right. You talk about, uh, again, as an arrow transfer. I watched this on, not to toot my own, toot my own horn, but a 65-inch UHD TV, and it's like... This is Return of the Killer Tomatoes. Yes. Holy cow! It looked. It just looked so stunning. Um, it's what ninety eight. Is it that long? It's not terribly long. Oh, this is long. from the late eighties. No, no, 90, how long? It oh, is. Uh, I mean, yeah, maybe ninety minutes. Yeah, maybe ninety minutes. And so the first half hour, I'm just sitting there going, yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd been so long since I'd seen Attack, which, as you say, um, maybe they're just getting their chops going on on Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. 
uh, and they did two others after this one, I believe. Yes. So I think this is really where the kind of nudge, nudge, wink, wink kind of feel came in, uh, and it really started working because after about half an hour or so, it won me over, and I started laughing not at it but with it, mm -hmm. and so that and that's the important thing. I do think it's too. Uh, um, uh, self-referential uh, several times they break the fourth wall and say wait we're making a movie we have to stop well I got it the first time you don't need to keep doing it you don't need to keep showing the Pepsi sign as the product spot and that's that's silly but um, but you know I got it and so that's maybe these for one of a better term younger filmmakers kind of learning uh, how when to stop and when to keep going but there's certainly enough clever going on for me, obviously, the real winning portion, John Aslan, is lots of fun. Uh, just chewing the scenery, William Shatner style. Um, but it's George Clooney. To see this mm -hmm. really silly young Clooney, and boy, you can see the Clooney of today in there. Uh, so, mu so much of him. Uh, a lot of the other supporting actors are lots of fun. So, um, yeah, as a comedy bit, and as this, this true cult classic, uh, I thought this was a great treatment of it, and if you liked the first one, uh, and, and even if you didn't see the first one, um, it's not important. Walter at all. watched this with me, and he and I both enjoyed it, and he he was all concerned. Oh no, I didn't see the first one. I don't think you have to see the first one, Walter. Go, don't worry about it. You didn't miss much. But in fact, they actually make reference to that. Right. There's a there's a lot of kind of silly in joking stuff that goes on. So I was really sort of surprised. Uh, I saw this in the theater and probably didn't get it at the time. Wow, um, the fact that this played in theaters is impressive. I, I remember seeing it at the Arlington, I think. Wow. Um, and, uh, but really enjoyed it on video, But besides the fact that it's just such a great transfer and Arrow does such a wonderful treatment to these films that they, that they bring back to you. That These it was important masterworks of Absolutely cinema. Absolutely right. Yes. Forget about Kane and the lost footage of a Magnificent Ambersons. Yeah. We want to see Return of the Killer Tomatoes. And we did. Don't you? And we did. So, uh, so that's all we watched. Well, that's not all we well, watched. Well, that's all that's, we that's, watched for the show. That's all we have time to discuss this Heck week. For the show now. Uh, we are not on next week. We're on next week. We're not here next week because it's the 4th of July, actually, on the day we taped. So uh, in two weeks, we'll have another show where we breathlessly run through 40 <laughs> titles exactly that we've right. watched. And uh, you may or may not care. So until then, I'm Mark. And I'm Tom. And we are the, the Cinemaniacs. Cinemaniacs. Happy... <laughs>